In una mattina del 2008 io fui contattato One morning in 2008 an art collector contacted me to examine his collection of paintings. della sua collezione. Io da storico dell'arte. As an art historian specializing in historic paintings, I immediately decided to go to his home in Salerno to look closely at his collection. A vedere questa collezione. Nicola Barbatelli. C'erano un centinaio di dipinti. There were about a hundred paintings in the collection. Some works were mediocre, and others quite interesting. At the end of my visit, the collector asked me to look at one particular painting. He showed me a portrait wrapped in a fleece blanket. I'll never forget that moment. He said, look at this little painting. It's a painting I want to auction off. Meet Galileo. What do you mean, Galileo? I said, it's Leonardo. I immediately thought it was a portrait by Leonardo because the iconography was found in a similar painting in the Uffizi Gallery. This painting, exhibited in Florence's biggest museum, the Uffizi Gallery, was considered for many years to be a self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. But in 1938, an expertise proved that it had been painted in the 17th century, 100 years after the artist's death. Therefore, it was a fake. How could the striking resemblance between the two paintings be explained? Could this portrait be the original one, copied in the Uffizi? Could it be the authentic self-portrait by Leonardo da Vinci, believed to have disappeared forever? A great deal was at stake here. There are only a mere 15 paintings by the Tuscan master and nobody knows exactly what the artist looked like. The potential discovery of a self-portrait by Leonardo da Vinci immediately raised the issue of dating. Nicola Barbatelli goes to see Giancarlo Napoli, a restorer specialized in expertizing works of art. In my life, I have been fortunate to have seen a large number of paintings because I have always worked for major museums and collections. My instinct and my eye have never let me down. However, in the case of this painting, when I saw it, since it was in such good condition, I thought it could have been one of those copies made in the 19th century. So my immediate impression when I saw it was that it was too beautiful to be from the 16th century. Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1452 and died in 1519. The Lucan portrait depicts a man of approximately 50 years old. If it represents the artist, it would have to have been painted in the early 16th century, in the city where Leonardo lived, Florence. In the 15th century, Florence was the city where an art revolution was brewing in painting, sculpture, and architecture. It would later become known as the Renaissance. For the 15th century, Florence had an extremely high literacy rate, and I should also say a very high rate of numeracy because of the fact that the Florentines were the great merchants of the Middle Ages. You had these great uh, first of all, wool merchants, and then secondly, the bankers. And so that then really becomes the economic precondition for the cultural efflorescence of the 15th century in Florence. 
the Florentines had a republic. They felt that they were unique in Italy, at least, in having a kind of self-government. And so if they looked for historical precedents for that kind of government, of course, they would look to the Roman Republic. And so their whole idea of having a, a renaissance was to bring back the, uh, the, the glories of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. The Medici dynasty was at the head of the Florentine Republic. They were bankers and art lovers. First Cosimo, then the man nicknamed by his contemporaries Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo was passionate about architecture and poetry. He contributed to the protection and promotion of many artists, including Botticelli, Michelangelo, or Leonardo da Vinci. One of the most important workshops in Florence was that of the sculptor and painter Andrea Verrocchio, a protégé of the Medicis. If you wanted to be an artist as a, a young man, say when you were 12, 13, 14, you didn't go to art school. What you did is went into a bodega, a, a workshop, and you became an apprentice. There was an apprenticeship system, and you went into the workshop of an established painter, goldsmith, sculptor. And in that workshop, you would learn all of the secrets of the trade. You would learn how to grind pigment. You would learn how to apply paint. You would learn silver point. You would learn draftsmanship. You would learn ultimately things like painting with tempera. And then finally, by the end of the, uh, the 1400s, at least how to paint in oil. Young Leonardo da Vinci began his apprenticeship at the Verrocchio Bottega in 1467 at the age of 15. He started off drawing and painting, but also learned sculpture, architecture, and mechanical arts. He remained with Verrocchio well into his 20s, and Verrocchio, I think, spotted Leonardo very early recognized his talents, nurtured them. And so we see the two of them in the 1470s working in tandem, working in partnership together. The baptism of Christ is a testament to this collaboration. Started by Verrocchio, this work was finished by Leonardo da Vinci, to whom the angel in the extreme left of the painting has been directly attributed. In parallel to this apprentice work, Leonardo da Vinci began to paint under his own name. The Benedictine monks from a Tuscan abbey commissioned his first work, the Annunciation. One of the fascinating things about the Annunciation is that we get a glimpse here of Leonardo at the start of his career. Even then, as a young man, he wanted to get everything right. He wanted to get the perspective of the hills right. So it was a convincing representation of what perhaps the Tuscan hills would have looked like. And crucially also, the wings of the angel of the Annunciation. These are the wings of someone who has looked at the wings of birds. I think Leonardo da Vinci's angel has a much better chance of flapping and, and flying and landing than that of any other angel that came before. In 1476, while Leonardo da Vinci was still working at his master's workshop, he received a commission for his first portrait of Ginevra da Benci, the daughter of one of Florence's most powerful families, close to the Medicis. Fifteen days after his initial visit, Nicola Barbatelli is contacted by Giancarlo Napoli. the restorer has finished cleaning the painting. Uh, 
era completamente cambiato. The painting looked very different. It had snags, dents, cuts. E allora ci eravamo chiesti We wondered where all this damage came from. The restorer told me that they had been covered by previous restorations, which he removed during his cleaning process. These marks are only the tip of the iceberg. When I started cleaning the painting, I noticed micro cracks, which were actually caused by the wood moving over the course of centuries. This is typical of Renaissance paintings. The restorator's conclusions are encouraging. But to confirm that the painting is definitely from the 16th century, it needs to undergo further investigation. This is the beginning of a major investigation, which will take the Lucan portrait across Europe. The first stop is the Innova Center in Naples, specialized in the scientific study of historical monuments and works of art. The Lucan portrait was given to Giovanni Paternoster, an expert in X-ray analysis. This technique makes it possible to determine the precise age of the pigments that were used. You must bear in mind that from antiquity through the end of the 18th or 19th century, pigments basically didn't change. They were mineral pigments or sometimes vegetable or animal-based. It was only from the 18th or 19th century onwards that synthetic or organic pigments were developed. Right off the bat, one element of the portrait, the white feather decorating the hat, intrigues the researchers. Its extreme whiteness seems to indicate that it was painted with a synthetic pigment. It could prove that the painting doesn't date from the Renaissance. To be sure, the experts x-ray the entire painting. Let's look at the graph of the cheek. There you have it. You can clearly see the presence of antimony. There is no pewter, and lead is very present. So it must be lead antimony, which could be a Naples yellow. The first traces of its use date back to the beginning of the 16th century. Naples yellow, vermilion red, indigo blue, or azure green. These sometimes toxic substances were prepared by the apprentices. They were mixed with egg to obtain paint referred to as tempera grassa, which will progressively be replaced by oil painting at the end of the 15th century. Here we can clearly see that the black on the hat has a much higher magnesium iron ratio, so it is probably umber or something similar. This pigment was common during the Renaissance. But what about the feather? Its pigment is made of titanium dioxide, which wasn't introduced until the beginning of the 20th century. This means that the feather was painted at a later date, probably during a restoration. Aside from the titanium dioxide used for the feather, all the pigments in the Lucan portrait are compatible with Leonardo da Vinci's era. For Nicola Barbatelli, this is a very promising result. He decides to pursue his analysis with Filippo Terassi, a physics professor. It is time to examine the painting's base. 
the wooden panel is x-rayed. We were able to identify the type of wood, poplar. Poplar was a very popular tree, very sought after by many artists for its lightweight quality. In fact, the Mona Lisa was painted on poplar. The back of the Lucan portrait was made up of pieces connected by an ingenious assembly system using butterfly joints. This type of assembly requires a certain level of botanical and technical knowledge because the goal is to avoid warping the wood, which could affect or ruin the paint. It is logical to assume that Leonardo had these skills and that he was able to find a way to build this kind of system.